Thank you, thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Dr. Ronco, for, uh, for the invitation and for having a full pediatric session and such an important meeting. So I will briefly uh, talk about the specific uh, aspect of AKI in neonates. Uh, Stuart already uh, touched upon this. I, I, I will try to go into deep. Um, I will shortly uh, repeat some physiology aspects uh, and uh, epidemiology, but I will specifically go into some pharmacological approaches that I want to remark. Uh, there will be only essentially a proof of concept studies because so far we do not have any uh, high level of evidence of any treatment effective for this deadly syndrome. So we've already uh, saw that uh, um, uh, nephrogenesis uh, uh, is something ongoing, especially in the preterm neonates, that uh, at birth these patients do not have a normal kidney function. Um, they receive only partially the uh, cardiac, systemic cardiac output. Uh, their renal vascular resistance are indeed very high, and that uh, glomerular filtration rate improves quickly, but only in the first days of life. So not only these patients do not have normal kidney function, but they all, uh, also have to deal with maternal creatinine. So in the first days of life, as we've already saw, uh, they, uh, their uh, serum creatinine is not normal. It's, it's not specifically due to their kidney function, but to uh, maternal creatinine. So also, they do not have a normal uh, urinary flow rate that increases quickly after uh, during fetal life, and uh, uh, their urine is not normal because it's highly hypotonic, hyponatremic, with a, um, a high level of uh, um, uh, potassium in, in the serum. The preterm neonate is all also uh, an interesting model of uh, um, acute kidney injury patient because uh, um, nephrogenesis in these kind of patients is still occurring and, and uh, it continues also in the extra uterine life and obviously it is suboptimal and probably it leads to uh, some um, um, subsequent uh, kidney damage. So, uh, in, a, in, a, in essence, uh, a, a neonate, especially when he um, is delivered before the 40th week, has a low glomerular filtration rate with a high level of renal vasoconstriction, hypotonic, high flow urines, hyponatremic, and hyperkaliemic. So, the first problem is diagnosis, obviously, and uh, a lot of authors uh, gave different, several different opinions on this, and that's why Stuart already told us about a, a lot of discussion about uh, classifications in neonates that, several, uh, that is significantly different than children and than adults. In this paper, these authors uh, first noticed that we have to differently classify their uh, normal, so-called normal urine output because we have two problems with neonates. We do not uh, uh, necessarily measure cre serum creatinine levels every day, uh, but we do uh, weight their um, uh, urine output, so we exactly know how much urine they are producing. And when you only when you classify the normal urine output by 1.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, you tend to have an exact uh, measure of their kidney function. So they proposed a modification of the rifle criteria in order to cope with this different urine output. Uh, totally differently. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, another group said the, the exact uh, opposed uh, um, issue. So they told us that uh, since we do not know exactly how the normal urine output of neonates is, we should stand, we should go for creatinine levels and pay a lot of attention to very small creatinine increases. So they essentially agreed with the akin definition, only modifying the, uh, uh, the uh, AKI3 stage by saying that the serocreatinine above 2.5 
defines uh, a severe acute great, um, kidney injury. And their cohort, the um, uh, incidence of AKI was 18%. So again, we see this number around 20 that is coming again. Um, uh, again, Stuart already touched upon this. Uh, it is not, uh, um, urine output is not only creatinine, absolute creatinine level, it might be also an issue of relative creatinine levels since uh, we've seen that these patients are decreasing normally their creatinine levels. It might be that uh, an abnormal decrease of their creatinine might be a signal of uh, kidney damage, and this author showed clearly this because uh, from a clinical standpoint, they were able to show that this decreased um, uh, creatinine normalization was associated with hard outcomes. Uh, finally, this author, uh, this year, Dr. Stojanovic showed, tried to uh, put together all of this information and, and essentially the important thing that I want to remark uh, that is that again, um, uh, 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 in preterm neonates, the number, the incidence was probably higher than well, what we see normally, 44% in their cohort. Uh, obviously, AKI was uh, significantly associated to, to gestational age, birth weight, and APGAR score, but also to longer duration of mechanical ventilation and, uh, and mortality, obviously. But above all, as already uh, uh, remarked by the AWARE study, non-neonate children, um, only when you're using both serum creatinine and urine output uh, criteria, you have a clear idea of the whole picture. And uh, if you use only one of those, you fail to identify the uh, exact incidence and you fail to identify any reliable therapeutic intervention. I want to remark this because a lot of studies on this issue are retrospective and generally they do use only serum creatinine levels because they are easy to detect in a retrospective way. So all of these studies might be biased in this, in this sense. Obviously, AKI was an independent risk factor for death, and uh, um, at the end, at the end, we have this modified neonatal KD criteria that essentially tries to um, uh, uh, to reconcile all of these um, all of these uh, aspects, and so you see that uh, the rise in serocreatinine has to be more than 0.3 to define acute kidney injury, but also that urine output is slightly different what what uh, uh, seen in uh, in children and, and in adults. So when we try to uh, see what happens in specific settings, we realize that a lot of studies have been, uh, as I told you, have been published on this, but all of them, when including neonates, they in all cases reported an, an increased incidence of AKI in this delicate portion of children with respect to older ones. Importantly, is not only an, an effect of uh, uh, reduced glomerular filtration rate, it is very important as the group of uh, Stuart uh, underlined to uh, adjust the levels of the solute target, such as, for example, creatinine, for fluid overload, because you must end up with the reclassification of your patients. So this is another important thing you have to, um, to uh, take into account. So just trying to put this into practice and uh, try to think what we, can we do about these patients just after having uh, learned that uh, it is very difficult to detect the patient we only know so far who are the, uh, those particularly at high risk. So uh, obviously early diagnosis is important in order to prevent renal injury. And um, I just wanted to show you some 
uh, as I told you, proof of concept uh, that uh, is probably the future of precision medicine. Uh, this is the most important thing we are going to do in the next years, that is to measure whatever molecule we are giving to our patient. We are currently trying to assess the levels of antibiotics that we are giving as a prophylaxis to our patients during cardiac surgery. And uh, even if cefoxicline levels, for example, are not specifically nephrotoxic, but we are trying to see what is the effect of the um, uh, therapeutic uh, actions like, like, such as surgery that we are uh, giving to our patient and what's happening to their uh, metabolism, to their pharmacokinetics, and to their kidneys. And what we've realized, for example, is that uh, after cardiac surgery, uh, the uh, uh, serum levels of this antibiotic, and it's not surprising to understand that this might probably occur with a lot of other drugs, are significantly variable. And they're significantly different from the first post-cardiac surgery day to the second. So probably these patients are have something ongoing, their metabolism and their creatinine clearance soon after that, the, the surgery that is, is ongoing and is improving uh, as, uh, in the moment the, uh, the surgery is getting uh, far. And uh, what we also realized that, uh, uh, is that uh, uh, the length of the cardiopulmonary bypass was not very uh, effective in modifying the levels of this antibiotic, but renal function was indeed, and the neonatal age was strongly associated with the levels of this antibiotics, and obviously the volume of the priming of this cardiopulmonary bypass. So uh, the kidney are affected or affect the level of this drug and probably of many others and the fluid loading of this patient do have an, a, a strong association with the, with the antibiotic level. So uh, prevention by strictly measuring drugs we are giving to our patient, that's my hope in the future, and I hope we'll be able to, to do a very strict therapeutic drug monitoring for our neonates. Early diagnosis, we, we've heard uh, that uh, it's difficult to, to measure urine output sometime, it's difficult to measure some creatine sometime. We do have probably other molecules, we, we, you've already heard about them um, uh, in these days, and this author uh, tried to measure urinary angle in a cohort of neonates just uh, during and after cardiopulmonary bypass again. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm quite cardiocentric, but that's my setting. And what they interestingly found was that not only urinary angle was strictly associated with the, um, um, and anticipated the um, occurrence of acute kidney injury in three different uh, sub-cohort of patients, but all, also, in my view, it was interesting that we're, they were already able to understand who were the patient deserving a peritoneal dialysis in the post-operative phase, so probably uh, we might be using these biomarkers in order to understand what is the best uh, timing and the best therapy, especially in terms of renal replacement therapy in the post-operative phase. Then we can also use these biomarkers or early diagnosis in order to evaluate therapeutic action. So, for example, why not to understand if a molecule such as urinary angle is significantly affected by something that we are giving to our patients? So, uh, knowing that uh, from a pathophysiological point of view, the renal vascular resistances of our patients are so high, especially when they are neonates, and they tend to increase when they are posed into cardiopulmonary bypass, and especially with hypothermia. We try to deliver to this patient a, a, a very high dose of naldopam during cardiopulmonary bypass, and we assess the renal function by measuring urinary angle. And so we use this molecule in order to understand if naldopam was doing something to the kidneys. 
What we, we found surprisingly, because we, we didn't believe at the beginning, was that fenolopamide at such dosage as a preventive measure did affect indeed urinary and gall levels, especially in the first, uh, uh, at, at uh, cardiac ICU admission and in the first 24 hours. The same was for cystatin C, the same was for uh, the biological action of uh, Phenoldopam, who is a vasodilator and a diuretic, and so pa patients who were receiving this drug uh, were receiving also less diuretics and less vasodilators. Obviously, IKI incidence uh, uh, was reduced, not significantly, but as we've already um, learned during these days, it might be that we are now selecting a cohort pa of patients with subacute AKI, and we are able to have a preventive measure in order to keep under control their renal damage by using biomarkers. I will uh, finish my quick overview of some therapeutic action by, mm, I cannot avoid telling something about the prevention of fluid overload, which is a, a really huge problem in these patients. And probably neonates are those who are leading the, um, the uh, school of thought about the, the concept of fluid overload because uh, as we were discussing yesterday, fluid overload in these patients is not only something that you can measure, but is something that you can see because they get so big and swollen that uh, you really appreciate the effect of fluid overload even from an aesthetic point of view. So my, my friend Stuart and his cardiac surgery, uh, post-cardiac surgery group uh, uh, already tried to address this issue by comparing peritoneal dialysis and diuretics in post-cardiac surgery patients. They, uh, um, uh, they developed a very well conducted randomized control trial and they compared 41 neonates uh, randomized to peritoneal dialysis and 32 randomized to receiving furosemide. They essentially did have some problems with the, in the PD group. Uh, they had to enroll some more patients due to some side effects due to PD, but essentially uh, they were not able to um, uh, demonstrate a significant difference in flu imbalance between the two groups but indeed, they were, um, there was a signal, and, and to, me, to me, the most important aspect of this study is that you have something additional to diuretics to give to this patient to take care of their fluid loading, and then, um, uh, so you can probably think to add the two, the two treatments in order to, to be particularly aggressive. Differently, we are indeed particularly aggressive in our patient with, with loop diuretics. We give tons of continuous infusion loop diuretics, and we felt the need to compare two of them that we currently use on a routine basis, furosemide and atacrinic acid. So we enrolled a cohort of uh, about 70 patients in a randomized control trial. They were uh, mostly, the, half of them were neonates, but they were very young people, uh, very severely ill, a lot of AKI, a lot of severe AKI in the postoperative phase. These patients indeed are diuretic resistant, and that's the reason why probably if diuretic are not the perfect drug to give to them, but we have to increase the dose in order to have an acceptable and an adequate urinary output. That's, at least that's our current strategy, and that's why we, we felt the need to understand which drug might be more effective than the other, and in our experience, ethacrinic acid was significantly more effective by uh, giving a, a, a higher urinary output with respect of diuretic dose, and indeed uh, was able to provide a lower fluid balance, especially in the first postoperative day. And for the first time in a prospective study, we were able to show that by giving this, we were able in the people with the best fluid balance 
to reduce the vent mechanical ventilation time, to reduce the length of, of time into the ICU. And interestingly, we also measured in a sub cohort of patients the cardiac index with the pulse contour method, and we were able to see that the patient with the better control of their fluid loading did have a higher, significantly higher cardiac index. So I, I'm concluding. We, I think it is clear that neonatal AKI diagnosis is complex. We are barely agreeing on classification, but still it's not easy to have the correct urinary output in these patients. It's not easy to have creatinine on a daily basis. Obviously, we have to timely identify those patients who are at risk. Uh, I mean, in cardiac surgery, it's quite easy. When you have a neonatal, you already know this is a highest risk patient, but real life might be different. Diagnosis should be coupled to prevention or, uh, um, uh, or therapy to be cost effective. So far, the use of biomarkers has not been uh, coupled to, a, to an effective therapy so far. So we need to provide a, a, a huge amount of research on this, but I mean, it is promising. Prevention and aggressive management of, of excess fluid loading is another mainstay of therapy, and it's so important. Thank you for your attention.